Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this, uh, this talk in the series, um, Ethics in the Public Sphere. And I'd like to give thanks for support to the Department of Philosophy, the Division of Arts and Humanities at UC San Diego, and the Institute for Arts and Humanities, all of whom gave generously to make this happen. So let me introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Cohen. I'm professor and chair in the philosophy department. And uh, before we get started with today's speaker, I wanted to just communicate something about the idea for this series, Ethics in the Public Sphere. So the idea is that there really is a wide range of problems where ethics intersects public life in quite substantive ways. Um, among those cases, I guess I would recognize at least two important subclasses. So one class is a set of scientific cases, technological cases, where scientific and technological development has outstripped, in some cases by quite a lot, our ethical reflection about the limits and scope of those technologies and, and scientific developments. So you see a lot of cases of that arising on this very campus, um, but also elsewhere. And in the second class, I would put a whole bunch of social problems about the organization of society, about the distribution of scarce resources, our obligations to others, the role of government, and so on. I hope you'll agree with me that uh, both classes of problems represent problems that are problems for all of us, not just for a set of cloistered philosophers, not just for a set of cloistered academics. So these are not just philosophical problems. At the same time, we think that we, the philosophy department and the community of philosophers, think that we philosophers have something distinctive to add to the discussion of these problems um, and to the conversation. In particular, philosophers bring frameworks for ethical, social, political thought, including a range of considerations of, of uh, you know, a wide number of cases um, and ongoing historical arguments between traditions. And so the thought is that philosophy can address the public sphere, bringing all this stuff to bear, adding considerations, adding historical perspectives, adding arguments that wouldn't otherwise be part of the discussion. The hope is that uh, by bringing uh, philosophers to these discussions in these ways, we won't simply be asserting that philosophy can be relevant, but we will be demonstrating in concrete ways um, that philosophy can be relevant by inviting prominent thinkers to address contemporary social problems of wide relevance um, in a public setting. So that's what we're up to here. And given those goals, it seems like Jeremy Waldron is an ideal person to have. Uh, he teaches legal and political philosophy at the NYU School of Law. Waldron has written extensively and influential, influentially on jurisprudence and political theory, including numerous books and articles on, among other things, theories of rights, constitutionalism, the rule of law, democracy, property, torture, security, homelessness, and the philosophy of international law. Among his many books, I want to mention three in particular. Um, one is One Another's Equals, The Basis of Human Equality, which is forthcoming in June 2017 with Harvard University Press, which is based on his 2015 Gifford Lectures at Edinburgh. His Political Political Theory, sick. Uh, essays on Institutions, and that came out in 2016. And his Torture, Terror, and Trade-Offs Philosophy for the White House with Oxford University Press in 2010. Waldron was born and educated in New Zealand, where he studied for degrees in philosophy and, and law at the University of Otago. And he was admitted as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of New Zealand in 1978. He studied at Oxford University for his doctorate in legal philosophy and taught there as a fellow of Lincoln College from 1980 to 1982. He has since taught at the Univers University of Edinburgh, the University of California, Berkeley, Princeton University, and Columbia Law School, and now uh, NYU. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1998, and he's a fellow of the British Academy since 2011. Waldron has given many prestigious academic lectures, such as the Tanner Lectures at Berkeley in 2009, the Holmes Lectures at Harvard Law School in 2009, the Hamlin Lectures in England in 2011, the Gifford Lectures in Edinburgh in 2015, and the Ethics in the Public Sphere Lecture in spring 2017 at UC San Diego. His talk today is entitled Death Squads and Death Lists, Targeted Killing and the Character of the State. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Waldron. Thank you. 
that microphone level good? All right. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've never set foot in the University of California, San Diego before, so it's a, it's, um, a lovely eye-opening experience to spend time here. Um, as Jonathan said, my topic is targeted killing, which means the officially authorized killing by military or intelligence officials of named individuals, named, identified individuals, without benefit of any judicial process. American killings of this kind, as you know, take place as part of what we call the war against terrorism, the war on terror. There have been thousands of such killings by the United States. They are authorized under the command of the president and his high national security officials. They are deliberate killings of identified individuals, sometimes by squads of special forces on the ground in various countries. The case we know best is the killing of Osama bin Laden by, by Navy SEAL forces in Pakistan, but most often from the sky by unmanned armed aerial vehicles or drones flying over countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, Iraq, and Yemen. That's the, that's the topic. As I understand it, the practice works something like this, or at least this is how it worked under President Obama. It's, uh, we haven't had a whole lot of information about how our targeted killing is working under President Trump, although I'll say a word or two about that later. The president and a committee of his high national security advisors maintain one or more lists of people whose continued existence is deemed not to be in the best interest of the United States. The list contains names, photographs, dossiers. Some people say it's a little bit like a high school yearbook. Um, it's drawn up on the basis of intelligence. These are the death lists that we keep. And from time to time, uh, under President Obama, the relevant committee met once a week, I think on Tuesdays. From time to time, as the opportunity presents itself, names are taken up from these lists and assigned to people who can arrange for the killing of the named individuals, usually by drone strikes from the air or the use of death squads on the ground. And my aim this evening is to talk a little bit about um, this practice and what it means for the character of the state that authorizes it. What I'm going to say about targeted killing proceeds on a fairly narrow front, and I wanted to just explain that at the beginning. Because there are, of course, all sorts of issues with the practice. There are all sorts of issues with the practice. Many critics are concerned about the effect of targeted killing on innocent civilians, that is, people who are not themselves involved in terrorist activities. What we sometimes refer to as collateral damage. Sometimes family and acquaintances of the named individuals are killed. Sometimes drones may, be, may fire at a car with several passengers, for example, or at a family gathering, a wedding, where the identified target is present. And critics who are concerned about this wonder whether it's possible to give assurances that people who are not actually those being targeted will not be harmed in the course of these killings. So that's one set of issues. Some critics worry too, this is secondly, about the process by which individuals are targeted. They wonder whether the right names are on the death lists. They ask about the integrity of the process that leads from intelligence reports to somebody's name being put up on one of these lists. Are there proper processes for reviewing and vetting the death lists and for taking names off as well as adding names on? I'm not going to proceed or pursue either of these two points. Pursued in isolation, each of them seems to imply, imply that if only we could be sure that the names on the death list were really those of the bad guys, or if only we could be sure that only bad guys were hurt uh, in this process, then there would not be a problem with targeted killing, or there would be much less of a problem. Each of the two concerns I mentioned does define a problem with targeted killing as it's currently practiced by the United States and other powers. And somebody needs to think about these issues of collateral damage and, and the integrity of the lists. 
But I'm going to say this evening that they don't get at the problem with targeted killing. The central issue from which we shouldn't flinch in our reflections on this practice is where the killings of this kind are appropriate at all. The issue is the sheer existence and use of such death lists by our government, however scrupulously they are maintained, however scrupulously they are implemented. And I think much the same we can say about some of the other objections that people have. Sometimes these um, uh, killings involve infringements of sovereignty. Arguably, the killing of Osama bin Laden was an infringement of Pakistani sovereignty. And again, that's an issue, and somebody ought to be concerned with it. But it's not the issue, for even if we were working only in the territory of a friendly power that was happy to accommodate our death squads, there would still be an issue about targeted killing as such. And there's a host of other side issues as well. People criticize the targeting of American citizens in these killings, like the killing of Anwar al awlaki in Yemen in September 2011. A criticism pursued as though the practice of targeted killing would not be so bad if the only people targeted were foreigners. People worry also about the use of drones as a new form of warfare, which seems finally to abandon any element of chivalry or reciprocity in combat. The vulnerability of targeted individuals to drone strikes from the air is now coupled with the complete invulnerability of those who operate the drones with a joystick maybe in a, in a, uh, uh, a mobile home in Nevada thousands of miles away from the site of the death. These are all important issues and again it's good that people are pursuing them but their pursuit should not be allowed to distract us from the main issue which is the adoption of a new practice of individualized killing by our government, the maintenance of death lists and the use of death squads. It's the targeting that concerns me, the hunting down and killing of individuals identified on a list as being marked for death and the maintenance of such lists setting up an ever-ending agenda for our death squads. It's not just a matter of asking whether we can come up with a justification for it, although that, of course, is worth asking. There are all sorts of things we might justify that would nevertheless reflect badly on us as a community. Whatever the justification, we must also ask ourselves whether we want to be the kind of country that maintains death lists and sends out death squads. Do we want this to become a permanent feature of state practice? Also, do we want it to become a permanent and respectable capability available in principle to any country in the world? Any of the 192 sovereign states in the world that might think of themselves as having particular persons or enemies. So that's what I want to reflect on, the possibility that this becomes a, a, a permanent feature of state practice uh, in the world. Now, I'm sorry, this has fallen off again. All right, I think that's better. Now, the language I'm using, the language of death squads, and death lists is ugly and emotive, but not because of any way I have embellished it. The phrases are crude and to the point. They are, as are these practices, about death. And they simply mention the fact that lists are maintained by the state of people marked for death, and that the killings are carried out by teams of, teams of men, military or intelligence people operating on the ground or remotely operating the machinery of death in the air. It's not possible to quibble about the literal sense of these phrases. But the terminology is ugly nonetheless because of its connotations. Death squads makes our national security apparatus sound sinister and brutal, like the tools used by Latin American dictatorships years ago, like El Salvador in the early 1980s, for example, or maybe more recently like President Duterte's um, war on drugs in the Philippines in the last few years. They conjure up images. They, they conjure up images of teams of brutal men operating under the deniable orders of a ruthless regime to kill and make an example of the killing of the regime's opponents in the cities and in the countryside. I shall kill, call these the classic cases of death squads and death lists. And I make no apology for these connotations. The resemblance, such as it is, between the t our targeted killing and these brutal practices, both covered under this terminology, is a salutary reminder of the sort of state we may be turning into. 
I mean a state in which this sort of killing is a standard way of uh, dealing with those whose continued existence is deemed unacceptable to the governing regime. Death lists and death squads are not the terminology favored by US government officials. The death lists are sometimes called kill lists, which is not much, not much better. Or kill or capture lists, a phrase in which the capture part has become largely theoretical. You can't capture somebody with a drone. I'm informed that in Afghanistan, the death list is referred to as the joint prioritized effects list. The teams of men that carry these killings out are sometimes called hit squads, although usually the language of squads is avoided altogether. At the very beginning of the recent wave of targeted killings, and we're talking during the presidency of George W. Bush, uh, the president suggested that it would involve a new form of warfare, a war that requires us to be on an international manhunt an international manhunt. The language of hunting, hunting down named individuals and killing them, was used throughout the 2000s. Donald Rumsfeld asked, how do we organize the Department of Defense for manhunts? In a 2009 report published by an entity called the Joint Special Operations University, called for the setting up of a national manhunting agency and building a manhunting force for the future. All of this, we should say, you know, and we need to understand and acknowledge this immediately, is because terrorist operations are carried out by particular individuals in rather small numbers. That's the, the background problem to which this, these practices are a response. And those individuals need, need to be hunted down, intercepted, and prevented if <coughs> large-scale killings of, of uh, ordinary civilians are to be avoided. Still just on this issue of terminology. For the killings themselves, all sorts of euphemisms are used. Take out and eliminate are used by officials who want to sound hard but don't want to say put to death. As for other terminology, one of my colleagues, Philip Olston, has noticed that leadership decapitation captures only some of the processes at stake. Assassination has become a term of art and may be distracting. Extrajudicial executions has the downside of building, per se, illegality into the description of the process. The Israelis have used the, urged the use of terms like preventative killing. Um, I could go on, but obviously this is a playground for what C.L. Stevenson uh, once called persuasive definitions. Um, so that's what we're talking about. One question we will ask, uh, are American practices of targeted killing over the last 20 years, not 20 years, 15 years, are those practices redeemed perhaps by the many differences that distinguish them from the classic cases of death lists and death squads like the El Salvador early 1980s case that I mentioned. We think of the, and some differences are trivial, although they're colorful, we think of the the classic death squad as a poorly disciplined bunch of brutal and unshaven men in sweaty uniforms who are sadistic in their mentality, perhaps beyond what their assignment requires. And that may be a misleading picture of our death squads, but deodorant and air conditioning in a trailer in Nevada take you only so far. It, what about the contrast between disciplined and undisciplined forces? As I said, the, the classic case seems to involve a bunch of undisciplined men carrying out brutal attacks. Well, it's worth noting that for a while, American drone operators were acting outside military discipline. That is, they were acting outside the military chain of command. Some of the people operating drones were not members of the armed forces, but intelligent operatives rather than military personnel. And strictly speaking, such intelligence operatives would count as unlawful combatants since they, unless they were somehow legitimately patched into military units. True, this is not the sort of indiscipline we envisage in the classic paradigm, but it's important nonetheless because it shows that targeted killings by our government haven't always conformed to a strict military model, and I'll come back to that. And the people who undertake them have not been drilled in the laws and customs of armed conflict. One thing we do know about um, President Trump's approach to these matters is that he has... Um, 
he has authorized the reintroduction of intelligent per intelligence personnel into these killing operations. President Obama, towards the end of his second term, had uh, insisted that this had to be done only by military people. Earlier in his presidency, it was being done by intelligence operatives. So President Obama insisted that these killings should be done only by military people. President Trump has reintroduced the CIA into the sharp end of these operations, at least so far as anti-ISIS operations in Syria are concerned. Now, in the classic paradigm, the killings carried out by death squads are politically motivated murders of political opponents of the regime. That's a sort of El Salvador model carried out in the regime's own territory. This is a major difference. American use of targeted killing has not occurred in our homeland, nor has it been used pursuant to any domestic agenda associated with political authoritarianism. But that contrast, though real, is complicated by two points. First, targeted killing is used by the United States not just to impact members of bona fide terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda, but also against insurgents rising up in insurgencies against governments that we support in Afghanistan and Iraq, for example. So it's rising up against insurgents at one, degree, at one remove. It's not insurgents against the United States regime, but insurgents against the regime of its allies. So, for example, although the Taliban certainly has strong connections or had strong connections with Al-Qaeda in the past, the use of targeted killings against Taliban leaders is mainly related to their violent attempt to overthrow the U.S.-sponsored regime in Kabul or to establish pockets or regions of resistance to its authority. Taliban targets are political opponents of regimes we are supporting or political opponents of our presence in the countries in which they operate. It might be said that in the classic paradigm, death squads target the political opponents of the regime whether they are engaged in armed struggle or not. In the classic case, death squads target armed and unarmed political opponents indiscriminately, whereas our practices of targeted killing are focused on combatants, usually unlawful combatants. I don't think we should ignore this distinction, but nor should we exaggerate. Consider the killing of Anwar Alalaki, whom I mentioned earlier, the US citizen, um, who was killed, uh, killed in, in Yemen. A case can be made that Alalaki was a very bad person whose activities were certainly not in the interests of the United States. He was an able propagandist and recruiter, and he was organizing and uh, inciting terrorist state actions. But he was not, as far as I know, a combatant himself. Targeting him would be like targeting a high enemy civilian official in a regular war, and, and that's a, a gray area. Classic death squads, El Salvador again, are used by authoritarian or national security regimes not just to eliminate their political opponents, but also to terrorize their subjects. Is there any comparable terroristic element in the practices that we're concerned with? Well, again, yes or no, I'm not sure. It's been suggested that drone killings have this as a side effect, that they do inflict mass terror upon entire populations. One account says, everyone is scared all the time. When we're sitting together to have a meeting, we're scared there might be a strike. When you can hear the drone circling in the sky, you think it might strike you. We're always scared. We always have this fear in our head. So there is maybe a terroristic effect, whether it's a terrorist intention is a further, further matter. In general, of course there are differences. Of course there are differences between the classic case of death squads and targeted killing by American forces in recent years. There are also always differences between any two sets of social, military, and political phenomena. The differences don't necessarily preclude their putting, being put under the same classification. Everything depends on whether the differences are differences of detail or differences that go to the essence of the concept under discussion. Or if you don't want to talk the language of essentialism, everything depends on whether the differences diminish the point that is supposed to be made by arraying both sets of practices under the same heading. I'm not wanting to argue at all that the American practice of targeted killing is the moral equivalent of the activities of the outfits we call death squads in the classic case. My position is that the American practice is much more like such activities than we should be comfortable with. 
much more like such activities than we should be comfortable with, and that classifying our practice using the same terminology may be salutary in our thinking about these matters. What about justification? No one thinks that the activities of Salvadorian death squads were justified, although it is said that the US kind of supported them at the time. But most people, many people certainly, think it is possible to justify uh, American targeted killing. All sorts of justifications are put forward. Some see targeted killing as just a limited instance of the killing of combatants in an armed conflict. It's perhaps the most persuasive line that's taken. So Harold Coe, that's K-O-H, Harold Coe, former dean of the Yale Law School and formerly, formerly legal counsel in the State Department in the Obama administration, maintained in a speech to the American Society of International Law in 2010 that as a matter of international law, the United States is in an armed conflict with Al-Qaeda as well as with Taliban and associated forces in response to the horrific 9-11 attacks. And it may use force consistent with its inherent right to self-defense um, under international law. That, now, when you're using force in such a military paradigm, you're certainly entitled to engage in sort of large-scale, anonymous, impersonal combat. But the suggestion that Harold is making is that if you know that some individual named and identified as a member of the forces with which you are entitled to engage in large-scale combat, then you are also entitled to engage in particularized attacks on that individual. They are simply by their status and activities, they have made themselves legitimate targets of attack, whether as part of a large collective or as a named and targeted individual. So, Against this background, Harold said it was appropriate to target individuals belonging to Al-Qaeda as combatants, just as one would target soldiers in an opposing army. He rejected the idea that these targeted killings were extrajudicial executions. It says that this has nothing to do with the military paradigm that he was using to um, justify them. And he brushed aside as irrelevant, this is interesting, he brushed aside as irrelevant the distinction that targeted killing goes specifically after named individuals, whereas ordinary warfare, the killing of combatants, is largely anonymous. Coe said, some have suggested that the very act of targeting a particular leader of an enemy force in armed conflict must violate the laws of war, but individuals who are part of such an armed group are belligerents, and therefore they are lawful targets under international law. He mentioned the operation called Operation Vengeance, which in 1943 targeted an airplane carrying Admiral Yamamoto, who was the architect of the Pearl Harbor attacks. Now, Admiral Yamamoto was a member of the Japanese Navy, uh, a Japanese combatant, therefore a member of the forces with which the United States was at war. And since he was liable to deadly force as such a combatant, it didn't make any difference whether we knew that it was him we were killing or not. That was, that's the argument that Harold mentions. All sorts of things one might say in response to this to support the suggestion that the listing and specific targeting of individuals by name might be significant. I found the following hypothetical case to be helpful in my reflections. Suppose you're a company commander in regular warfare, and you are instructed to attack a defended position on a hilltop over there. The position is held by a few score enemy soldiers, and you are commanded to attack it with a company of men. This is like something out of Band of Brothers or something like that. Um, just before jump-off time, one of your superior officers hands you a list of names and photographs of, say, 15 members of the defending force, instructing you, if at all possible, to ensure that those individuals are killed in the course of the operation. Would one simply accept the list and shrug and say, well, that's war, those people are enemy soldiers, they're liable to be killed anyway in this operation? Or would we expect alarm bells to go off in the mind of the company commander why am I being given this list of names? 
I know they're all combatants and they're all defending the position that I'm about to attack, but why are these ones being singled out? Is it because they're surviving the campaign will make post-victory governance more difficult? Is it because of their background? Are they communists? Are they Jews? Is someone taking the opportunity presented by otherwise legitimate combat to settle a score, or what? What's going on? My intuition is that we would feel that the handing over the list was, use an old English term, a little bit rum, a little bit odd and unsavory. Uh, it would feel like some sort of abuse of military privilege, but one that is very, very hard to put your finger in on once you accept that the names on the list are people who are liable to deadly attack anyway. The point I really want to make is that even if we can concoct a justification for targeted killing, we should distinguish between justifying the practice in a narrow legalistic sense and the broader question of what misgivings we should feel about the character of the statecraft that now uses these methods as a regular instrument of national policy. Professor Coe and others write as though once a plausible or even a just presentable line of justification has been sketched out, there can be no further room for concern. And one of the philosophical points I want to make today is that we shouldn't think about justification in that narrow way. I think much the same can be said about a different set of justifications that we sometimes hear about. I talked about this with some of the, the graduate students um, earlier, earlier today. Um, my friend Nigel Bigger, B-I-G-G-A-R, is professor of moral and pastoral theology at Oxford in England. Theologians get involved in these, in these debates. And Nigel has suggested that targeted killings may be regarded as acts of justice. In a letter to the Times in London after the killing of Osama bin Laden, he said, this is a quotation from his letter, those who argue that bin Laden should have been brought to trial rather than killed tend to suppose that justice only takes place in courts. But when soldiers mount a highly discriminate operation in order to put an end to the active threat posed by an inveterate and murderous enemy, when they have good reason to allow him no chance whatever of escape, and when he does not immediately and unequivocally surrender, and when they therefore kill him, justice, said Nigel, is done. If that is indeed what happened in Abbottabad, then justice was done, rough justice. It may have been rough justice is rough, but it is still justice. Now, Professor Bigger is surely right to insist on the category of rough justice and on its possible applications in warfare. Justice doesn't always require the apparatus of a courtroom. Just as, I don't know, rough medicine or rough surgery doesn't always require uh, an anesthesiologist or an operating room. If you're on a mountainside with a badly injured person, rough surgery has to take place, and we have to accept the risks of it. But justice can be rough in two senses. It can be rough in the sense that there was a rough version of the procedure that justice would ordinarily require, or it can be rough in the sense that it omits any element of procedure whatsoever and assesses the killing on a purely outcome basis. Bin Laden's being alive after the atrocities of 9-11 is an injustice. His being dead in May 2011 is justice. We do sometimes talk about justice in this utterly outcome-focused way. But whether we should be comfortable with this as a general approach to justice is another matter. I mention these two lines of justification because the, the dichotomy between them is also instructive. We often talk about approaching the war on terror in terms of a choice between a law enforcement mode and a military mode. Do you remember in the 1970s and 80s when Britain faced major terrorist outrages stemming from the conflict in Northern Ireland? It insisted, at actually great cost to the government and people, that the terrorist suspects who were detained were ordinary criminals and were to be locked up with a general prison population and not allowed to wear uniforms. And that led to a great deal of protest among the detainees, including the dirty protests and the hunger strike. Um, and the line that was being held there was this was to be dealt with utterly under a law enforcement paradigm. These men were murderers, and they were to be locked up with other murderers. The alternative paradigm is a military paradigm. These are enemies, and they are to be fought as other enemies. 
And it's plain that targeted killing operates a little bit on the cusp of those two paradigms. The, the, the named individuation of the individuals reeks of the law enforcement paradigm. But the, the, the use of peremptory force against them reeks of the military paradigm. And some people have suggested, the Israeli High Court suggested this in its 2006 consideration of targeted killing. I should mention that the Israeli High Court has distinguished itself from our own judicial institutions and in being willing to address the subject head on. It suggested that, in effect, unlawful combatants involved as part of terrorist organizations are going to have to face, if you like, the worst of both worlds. They're going to be treated as under, under both paradigms. Um, they're going to be treated under the military paradigm, maybe captured, maybe killed, maybe captured. If they are captured, they won't be treated as regular POWs, but they'll be put on trial before military tribunals for their offenses. And um, I can say a little bit more about the Israeli case in, in the discussion. It, it, it basically argued that when all is considered, we have to allow the possibility of targeted killings of those who are attacking, attacking the state. So anyway, there are these two lines of justification which may well feed off each other or complement each other or work together in various ways. And I don't want to rule out the possibility that targeted killing or many instances of targeted killing might be justified along the lines that I've mentioned. But what if they are? What if we have no alternative but to engage in killings of this kind as part of the global war against terrorism? I believe we still need to consider a further question whether we, sh we should consider the kind of state that our possibly justified response to these exigencies is turning us into. And the language of death squads and the language of death lists may be helpful in jolting us into this additional layer of consideration. I want to say that concocting a moral or a legal justification of a practice is not all that there is to a critical or evaluative assessment of it. A justification doesn't necessarily reconcile us to a practice. For that, we may want to consider its broader character, what more generally it says about us and our institutions. The professional philosophers in the room can listen especially to this next bit. In moral philosophy, we sometimes distinguish between the assessment of actions by deontological or consequentialist criteria and the assessment of character, the assessment of character uh, in terms of virtue ethics. They're not necessarily the same. A justified action in certain circumstances may reveal a bad character or a character of a certain sort that might not involve a favorable assessment. Sometimes, for example, we might describe a morally scrupulous person as a prig or a pedant. Sometimes we may have reason for avoiding the company of and not wanting to have anything to do with a person who has acted in a certain way even when his acting is justified. If you consider classic cases of dirty hands in politics or in warfare, Michael Walser has pointed out, sometimes we accept that certain actions that would normally be regarded as wrong or even atrocious must be undertaken by those who have responsibility for the security and well-being of a community, even though those actions inevitably taint not just the reputation but the character of those who feel morally compelled to undertake them. A president orders the nuclear bombing of an American, excuse me, of an enemy city that doesn't involve a military target in order to end a war. Or a politician orders the torture of a prisoner to get information that will help resolve a ticking bomb situation. Even if we were to accept that such action was justified, we would not necessarily say that the character of the individual who undertook them was left untainted by the, by the action. All this is controversial, theoretically, but this is the position that I want to pursue. Max Weber, whom we also talked about in our discussions, Today. Max Weber cited Machiavelli, who in a beautiful passage, this is a quote from Weber of the History of Florence, has one of his heroes praise those citizens who deemed the greatness of their native city higher than the salvation of their souls. People who were prepared to do things to save the city that would put the salvation of their souls at risk. That may be a little bit extreme, but Weber's more general thesis is not that a person who 
gets themselves involved in politics must understand that politics is a potentially violent practice. And he lets himself in for the diabolic forces lurking in all violence, even when such action, violent action, is justified. Now, this is not the, the place or the afternoon to embark on a general consideration of the, of the problem of dirty hands. My invocation of Machiavelli and Weber is just intended to illustrate the point that the justification of an action, it was the best thing in the circumstances, is not all that there is to be said, or may not be all that there is to be said about the character of those who undertake it. In warfare, this is said with, with um, some humility, those who engage in combat have to live with the fact that they have killed other human beings. And there are important depths of ethos, honor, and military tradition that enable people to describe themselves as not murderers. Killers may be, but not murderers in, in what they have done. And it's an important part of military ethos and military psychology that resources be made available to people to do this. And my understanding from conversations with people who have been involved in targeted killing is that even among those who understand the necessity for targeted killings, that self-understanding is a little bit more difficult, a little bit more difficult to apply for a multitude of complicated reasons. We think it's important for men to be able to go back to their homes as men, not murderers, uh, from having involved themselves in killings. And we need to consider the circumstances under which that's possible and the circumstances under which that's more difficult. But listen, I mean, it's really not my intention today to assess the character of the persons who engage in these killings. A lot of honorable men involved. No doubt there are things to be said on this front. Immanuel Kant said some of them. He said it's very important that we not use methods in war that would disqualify our warriors from being regarded as citizens thereafter. He talked about the use of assassinations. He talked about use of poisonings and other, other particular tactics. The tinge of something like assassination is, is um, obviously present in the cases that we're considering. So. But what interests me is the character of the state that authorizes the, uh, these operations, not the character of the killers themselves. I raise the difference between virtue ethics on the one hand and the assessment and justification of actions on the other hand. Now, we don't usually talk about the virtues of states, but we do talk about the character of states and thinking a little bit about the character of a state that commits itself to these practices is going to be worth thinking about. So, for example, we classify states in various ways and for various purposes. We talk about nation states, confessional states, liberal states, constitutional states, rule of law states, welfare states, mercantile states, laissez-faire states, night watchman states, police states, rogue states, totalitarian states, national security states, and so on. Obviously, these are not all value-neutral terms, but nor are the derogatory connotations of some of them simply the upshot of the performance of unjustified actions by the state in question. They have to do with ethos and character in as much as those permeate the astonishingly large array of institutions and practices that the existence of any state involves. I think it is worth dwelling on these characterizations when they become available or when it becomes plausible to apply them to a state in which we are interested or implicated, when we would describe a state as a rule of law state, when we would describe a state as a, um, a national security state, and so on. So here's what I really want to say for today's lecture. In my view, the use of death lists and death squads changes or complicates the character of our state, the United States, so far as the use of lethal force is concerned. And it's worth contemplating this change or complication. It does so even if the justifications I mentioned go through. For even if there is a military laws of war justification, 
the use of death squads as a different kind of operation from the combat operations we are concerned with, we are used to. Or even if the use of death squads is intended as rough justice, it's a radical departure from the business of trying and punishing violent individuals, including terrorists, as criminals. It's a different kind of activity. And the question is, does it make us into a different kind of society, a different kind of state? So let's reflect on that a little bit. We owe again to our friend Max Weber, writing in his great essay, Politics as a Vocation, in 1919, the proposition that states generally are to be defined as such by reference to the force that they monopolize. A state, says Weber, is a human community, an organized human community, that successfully claims a monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. That really characterizes states, something as a state in terms of the means that it uses rather than the ends that it pursues. In his great work, Economy and Society, published in, originally in 1921, which I think must have been posthumous, Weber added the following qualification. It goes without saying that the use of physical force is neither the sole nor even the most usual method of the administration of political organizations, but at the same time the threat of force, in the case of need, its actual use, is the method which is specific to political organizations and is always the last resort when other things have failed. Now, physical force could cover a variety of phenomena from pushing and shoving and dragging people out of airplanes and, and um, through incarceration all the way to killing, the use of deadly force. And though he refers to force of all kinds, I think we are particularly interested in that aspect of Weber's conception that refers to lethal force. We might want to say in particular that a state is an organization that successfully claims a monopoly on the legitimate use of lethal force within a given territory. So bearing that in mind, bearing that as a sort of a background template for thinking about what a state is, one might begin to categorize states according to the way in which or the various ways in which they govern and regulate and authorize the use of lethal force when it's necessary, when it happens. The United States makes a claim to be a rule of law state, and I think with good reason, because it, it organizes lethal force under legal auspices in the following ways. Number one, if I had a board here, I'd write this up, number one, <coughs> self-defense. Under the most stringent conditions, ordinary people and law enforcement officers are permitted and authorized to use deadly force in defense of themselves or others in the face of an imminent threat to their own or others' lives. Of course, we disagree about when this happens, as in all the cases of police killings, but we accept the general principle that under law, self-defense can be, in many circumstances, a legitimate reason for the use of deadly force. So one, self-defense. Two, deadly force may be used by way of execution for the most serious offenses, but only pursuant to a judicial order following a criminal trial associated with the most stringent safeguards and appellate opportunities, or at least that's the theory. So we authorize the use of lethal force, like lethal injection, for example, uh, in executions. And number three, the state may authorize the use of military force in combat against enemy combatants in war, but again under the strict regulation of the laws of armed conflict. So in this package of three possibilities, individual self-defense or defense of others, capital punishment, and uh, properly authorized and, and disciplined military force, the modern state reveals itself as having a broadly rule of law character in this area that matters, namely lethal force. The rule of law is thought particularly important where death is involved, the modern state is a Weberian entity with deadly force available as a last resort, but the use of that force as a large last resort is highly regulated by familiar bodies of law. Some modern states, not many parts of the United States too, reject the second item on this list, capital punishment, although they reserve the right to resurrect the death penalty should it be needed or demanded by their citizenry. <coughs> 
Be that as it may, these three conditions together define a particular kind or character of state on the basis of how the use of deadly force is regulated. My claim in this lecture is that our present practice of making official lists of people who are to be killed and authorizing small squads of military and intelligence people to hunt them down and kill them represents a fourth and new relation between the state and its definitive power of authorizing legal force. Right? Self-defense, capital punishment, military operations, and now death squads. That is, the state maintains lists of individuals who are designated as enemies of the state, whose continued existence is thought seriously adverse to the interests of the state, and from time to time names are taken up from these lists, and their bearers are hunted down and killed by squads of military and intelligence people dedicated to that mission. It's not unprecedented for states to operate in this way. My intention in taking advantage of the ugly connotations of the language of death lists and death squads is to draw abrupt attention to that point. We are not the first to go down this path of the state maintaining lists of enemies to be eliminated, but it's a terrifying path so far as the character of our state is concerned. It defines an additional relation between the state and lethal force. Now, we saw in the previous comments that attempts have been made to justify targeted killing by assimilating it, either to execution or assimilating it to military operations. I argued a moment ago that even if those arguments succeed on a narrow justificatory front, they do not settle the question of whether a new form of state control of deadly force is emerging here. Even if the use of lists, death lists and death squads arises out of the third of our categories, or even if it is, as Professor Bigger believes, a rough form of the second, it still is in itself sui generis as a form of state involvement with death under the, the regime that just had one, two, and three. We didn't not ordinarily make lists of named individuals in the course of combat, and although we do execute named individuals in criminal cases, we do so after processes of trial that have no equivalent in the case of targeted killing. So in general, then, attempts to cabin the, first, the fourth category within categories one, two, or three involves a great deal of pushing and shoving and some degree of misconception and dis distortion. Moreover, Suppose that we were dealing with El Salvador in the 1980s and its undoubted practices of the use of death lists and the use of death squads. I don't think we would countenance for a moment any argument by an El Salvadorian government official that the use of death lists and death squads could be put into any of the three other categories. We would say what's gone wrong in El Salvador is that they have invented a fourth category of killing individually named uh, enemies of the state classic death squad practice would strike us as a distinct and disreputable form of the relation between the state and deadly force. We would have to have something like four available in our possible chart of state practice to account for the particular character of such operations. And then my point is that once four is available for El Salvador, it's not entirely clear that, that we're entitled to avoid it for characterizing our own processes. I mean, so far this is just taxonomy but it's taxonomy that's supposedly um, relevant for thinking about um, character. This analysis is rather formalistic. Is it important that the state has taken on this new character, that it's added targeted killing to its other modes of organizing and regulating the use of lethal force? I don't want to say it's the most important characterological trait or that it overwhelms all other interests that we have in the sort of state that we have become. But characterizing the state's use and regulation of lethal force is important, and lethal force under the fourth heading is an important part of what we do with lethal force. Targeted killings by the United States in recent years have numbered in the low thousands. That's what we know. We put to death through targeted killing many, many more people than are executed pursuant to capital punishment in the United States. And there are many, many more targeted killings than there are justified homicides in self-defense. As for combat casualties, it's true that we've inflicted very large numbers of casualties uh, in recent wars, half a million or more in Iraq alone since 2003. On the other hand, the statistics on targeted killing are of the same order of magnitude as the combat deaths that American forces have themselves suffered 
in these conflicts, which again is not an inconsiderate, we're not talking about a tiny problem, we're talking about a significant problem. These statistics are not conclusive any, of anything except that targeted killing is not an inconsiderable aspect of the state's use of deadly force. Don, I know I'm going on too long, but if you'd if you, if you let me go on for another 10 minutes. Um, maybe we can trust President Obama and President Trump to make careful and conscientious use of this new state practice of killing. But it's part of the wisdom of our political philosophy that we should always consider the ways in which a given power can be abused. Always. Obvious, and, and that need to consider how powers can be abused does not evaporate in the presence of the necessity of such powers. Obviously, there should be particular concern in our reflections on new ways of using le uh, lethal force. So that requires us to stand back from our present support for targeted killing and to ask ourselves a little bit about possible forms of abuse, now focusing on us, not El Salvador. We can do this historically by considering ways in which programs akin to the use of death squads have been abused in the past. The Phoenix pro uh, Program of Assassinations in South Vietnam, 1965 to 1972, springs to mind. Or another way to ponder this is to imagine the use of this power to list and target enemies of the state with deadly force. Imagine it becoming a regular feature not just of our state practice, but that of other countries as well. Russia and Israel already engage in something like our program of targeted killings. In Russia's case, we can certainly see possibilities of abuse. But imagine this became true of all countries. Just as all countries maintain death for defense forces, just as all countries have reserved the right to use capital punishment, at least in the past, just as every country in its law privileges self-defense, so we might imagine that every country, every country, keeps and maintains a list of enemies and from time to time takes names up from that list and has them disposed of. We have to reflect on this practice becoming business as usual in general for modern statecraft, for an array of modern states, not all of whom are to be trusted. I suppose we might respond with something like a non-proliferation principle, the one that we use for nuclear weapons. We own thousands of nuclear weapons. We have used them against civilian populations, but we maintain that even if there's justification for us to maintain this arsenal, we're going to very strictly limit the proliferation of nuclear weapons among the other 192 countries in the world. And maybe we should approach, we should approach um, death lists and death squads on that, same, on that same principle. But given the way that we justify them, if we do justify them, we can hardly say that it's, a, it's an outrage for other countries to consider them. Other countries face terrorist threats as we do. Other countries have these mortal enemies that they think need to be disposed of. If the arguments are good arguments, there seem to be arguments for any sovereign to use. And if the arguments are good arguments, there's no telling of when they'll be abused in the justification of deadly force. If we imagine this power in the hands of other states, we need to consider how the categories that govern our use of it might expand in the case of other regimes. I don't just mean rogue states, I mean some of our closest allies. Best example is the United Kingdom. As I said in an earlier piece on all this, the British experience is particularly sobering as it clung to the remnants of empire. Britain faced insurgencies in Palestine, Cyprus, Aden, India, Malaya, and elsewhere. At one time or another, the British government denounced as terrorists those who eventually emerged to become leaders of these countries, Kenyatta, uh, Begin, Makarios, uh, well-known examples. The temptation to respond to insurgency by targeting people who could be described as terrorists, convincingly or plausibly, would no doubt be irresistible if it were not for the presence of very strong legal norms prohibiting assassination. Well, think the, of the use that might have been made of such principles in the conflict of Northern Ireland. We know the British government was comfortable framing and imprisoning innocent people in the struggle against terrorism there and would no doubt have been comfortable hanging them had hanging been available. A judge made comments at sentencing to that effect. It is impossible to imagine that if targeted killing had been respectable as a state practice in the 1970s, it would not have been used to kill IRA and Sinn Féin leaders, including some who are currently Stormont and Westminster politicians. All of this we need to reflect on 
as part of the responsibility of political philosophy, which is to think about how a given set of powers might be abused and not abused just fancifully, but abused in the real, in the real world. We've got to think a little bit, if you like, when we're talking about the realm of killings, and we're going to talk, think a little bit about the standard temptations of the realm of killings in the realm of, of killings in the realm of politics. There's a temptation in politics to respond to insurgency or to other serious political difficulties at home or in outlying provinces or abroad in regimes that we support by targeting people who can be described as terrorists. And it's a difficult temptation to resist. In politics, in the pursuit of national security and the maintenance of empire, the stakes sometimes seem to be very high. The viability of national policy may be at stake, or innocent lives, or the survival in office of not so innocent politicians. Politicians have to deal with things like insurgencies. An insurgency, whether justified or unjustified, may pose what seems to be a grave threat to values by, like public order. And it may seem that sometimes it would be better to simply hunt down and take out those who are posing this threat to the life of the nation than to continue risking the values that the government stands for. Such a tactic might seem more decisive and effective than what can be achieved through the long drawn out procedures of ordinary law enforcement or the long drawn out procedures of negotiation. Assassinating one's enemies has always been one of the standing temptations of politics and government. Through fragile structures of law and ethics, we have sought to make it unthinkable, out of the question, literally out of the question. In the words of Bernard Williams, great philosopher, um, I mean by that that there is no question of it and that it would be thought outrageous or insane to even mention it as an option. The situation is not one of those in which such options are mentioned and then all things considered laid aside. W Williams once observed that we don't want politicians in difficulty with some, some opponent to go around saying, well, of course we could have them killed, but I guess that's out of the question. You know? <laughs> you know, that's sort of one thought, to, one thought to many. And I fear that the adoption and establishment of a practice of targeted killing as a state practice is a step, perhaps a baby step, on the path to a situation in which killing opponents who can be defined as enemies of society is no longer out of the question in the same in the same way, we, we have built up these fragile inhibitions on the use of assassination abroad and at home. And the worry is that this might represent an early stage in the unraveling of that. So let me finish. This paper, as you will have spotted, is not friendly to the practice of targeted killing. One can understand the motivation for the practice and the pressures and hard choices that are faced by those charged with protecting the security of the American people. One can appreciate the attempts that have been made to provide a legal justification for it. But ultimately, it is a practice of hunting down and killing individuals who have been identified one by one as enemies of the state. Their names are on a death list, and they are hunted down and killed by death squads pursuant to an executive determination at the highest level that they're continuing to live is incompatible with the interests of the United States. I believe that confronting the practice using exactly this vocabulary is a helpful way of coming to terms with the character of targeted killing. I don't mean that it disposes of the question of whether we should use targeted killing. I hope to have conveyed only that it raises our sense of the seriousness of what the use of targeted killing involves. What is this practice? What is it like? What is it like? And what is its normalization turning us into? What does it mean for it to become business as usual in the conduct of state affairs? Those are the questions that we should be raising. And I hope that talking this otherwise objectionable talk of death lists and death squads can help jolt us into asking these questions. That's it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
So I'm going to start in the back here. Thank you. Professor, is there any evidence that any of this works? I mean, uh, as, as, as Victor Laszlo told Major Strasse in Casablanca, you can kill one, one of us, but there'll be more to follow. Yeah, yeah. So um, the answer is to rebut that hypothesis, no. It may buy some time, particularly when, when uh, it is used in a decapitation of leadership process. And it depends also the way in which it's used. The Israeli defense forces often use targeted killing against people who are moving immediately or imminently to involve themselves in terrorist operations. And so it, it maybe works in those circumstances, whether it still, whether it still generates the, um, the hydra-headed possibility that you have mentioned is a, is a further question. So under the heading of this is like this is like uh, military force, one would have to ask the question of effectiveness as well. And one could criticize it on, the, on, on those grounds, certainly. That would be, I don't want to say it's a distraction, but I think about this issue, as I have said in other work about torture, that we have to confront what we would say about this practice on the assumption that it does work. And then add as a further line of questioning, and suppose it doesn't work. But the fact that it might or might not work cannot be the only, only objection to it. I think that's what I want to say. But I, I entirely take your point. Thanks. Um, in, uh, in his book, uh, Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century, Jonathan Glover talks about, he uses the term a moral slide, the moral slide into targeting civilians in, in, in warfare in the 20th yes. century. Um, and I, you know, I wonder whether, whether that's applicable um, uh, to, to think about the actions of the of the of the U.S. in in regard to assassination, and whether the, um, the the El Salvador example that you talked about is actually kind of more um, relevant to the drone assassination programs today than than you give credit. I mean, you said that the U.S. supported these death squads, but you know, actually the School of the Americas, the, the leader of the El Salvadorian death squads graduated from the US military School of the Americas and declassified documents have shown that you know, the training manuals included instructions for torture and um, they included the term neutralization, which yeah. I think means killing basically. Um, and you know, so the, the, whether you know, that's part of actually a long-term moral slide in the character of the, the state um, towards, towards the, these sorts of practices. Um, my second question is that, well, here at UCSD, you know, the, this question isn't really, um, um, isn't really academic in the sense that it's, um, it's very real here because the um, U UCSD uh, Jacobs School of Engineering um, is, is a center for drone research and they have very close ties to the corporate affiliates, such as General Atomics, Northrop Grumman, and other military industrial firms that manufacture drones. And they've actually done research, you know, in 2006, there was a Jacob School researcher here at UCSD who did a project with Northrop Grumman that involved researching how to add payload to the Hunter drone, which was previously a reconnaissance drone that was turned into a, a lethal drone. And as I understand it, adding payload meant enabling the drone to carry bombs and bigger bombs. So, um, you know, Weber also wrote science as vocation, and I wondered if you had anything to say about the kind of moral responsibility of scientists to think about how their, and engineers to think about how their research is, um, is utilized. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say about the second point, although we, we work with the ethics of this with regard to other forms of lethal intervention as well, notably the involvement of physicians in capital punishment. Um, I didn't know the points about the Jacobs School of Engineering and I, I, I take them on board. I would have crammed them in as local color had I, had, I, <laughs> had I, I mean, it's a very, very important point. It's true with all weaponry, not just, not just drones, but if I'm right that this is a new form of statecraft and it's a particularly ominous form of development. On the first point, the Jonathan Glover point about the moral slide, of course, that's right, and as Glover would acknowledge, this moral slide 
began long before the drone generation. It began with, with uh, the uh, large-scale attack on civilians uh, on both sides during the Second World War and the development of doctrines of deterrence that involved threatening and therefore conditionally intending to incinerate centers of population during the, the Cold War, again, by both sides. Um, so there's plenty there so far as moral slide is concerned. What's interesting about this case is that it's a smaller scale case than this. And some of the honorable defenders of targeted killing would want to insist quite emphatically that it may represent a slide in another direction because they use the term surgical or razor-like accuracy. This is a way of, of limiting the number of people who are killed compared to, say, large-scale bombing operations of the sort with which we're also, also familiar. So I didn't want to let the occasion go without mentioning it. Arneson had a question. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, you, you gave us this um, hypothetical, so I wanted to shift it a little bit because yeah. I wonder whether there might be a better one. So imagine that instead of going after, instead of having, as you, as you recall, the, the hypothetical had to do with this uh, group of enemy soldiers who are defending some position. Now imagine that those um, soldiers uh, have their fingers on on buttons that will send missiles to New York City or some other, say, um, town where there are innocent civilians, the yep. American civilians, and uh, they're not wearing uniforms. They're just plain clothes, um, enemy combatants. And now they're not in a just, they're not in an outpost, right? They're now scattered around um, in a coffee shop. And now your commanding officer gives you a, 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 a uh, just before you go off and, and, and go off to the, gives you the faces and names of the, of the individuals who have their fingers on the button and says, go off and kill them um, so that you can distinguish them in part from the population that they're, you know, right. the innocent people that they're among. if you among. can't distinguish them, you can't get the, right, the exactly. button pushed. So now I'm thinking, now, now my sense uh, is that this is much more like the sort of situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and my sense of, you know, not, my, my sense of rumminess, uh, so, so to speak, uh, dissipates. Yes. Um, and, and so I don't think that we can, I, I just don't see the, the worries uh, of that sort. And one of the things that this brings out, I think, is, is that imminence uh, or imminent threat is really what's at issue here. Um, and, you know, that's certainly one of the things that bothers me about targeted killings is that we're killing people who are often not imminent threats to anyone. Um, Whereas in the kind of situation I was envisaging, uh, where there's this military operation against persons who do pose an imminent threat, there isn't as much of a problem. Yeah. I really appreciate uh, both sides of this, of this question. So um, you're absolutely right. That, that uh, way of conceiving the list giving to the officer uh, dismisses the rumminess. And we can utterly understand what's going on. And if the officer were, uh, were to ask, why am I being given the list, the story could be told to him and it would represent a persuasive, persuasive justification. So, um, so what's this example doing in, in, in my account? Uh, mostly it's there just in order to convince us that we're not dealing with ordinary military operations, that there's something different about being given the list that takes us a little bit out of the realm of ordinary military operations, which your example does too not in an unjustified way, but in a justified way. Um, it's not like a law enforcement operation, but it may be a little bit closer to that. The idea is um, to get people who are in control of particular weapon systems. Um, so I, I, I certainly appreciate the distinction, and what it leads me to do is to modify my own sense of what can be achieved by the, um, the list of names hypothetical. Um, Sometimes when you give a person's name, this is a, like an idiot philosophy of language point, 
a person's name is like a, a clearinghouse or a nexus by which everything that you might know about them can be gathered together. So, so Jeremy Waldron is this New Zealander. Jeremy Waldron is this legal philosopher. Jeremy Waldron is this speaker in San Diego. These, the name ties all these attributes together. And with a, a list of names being given in combat, it's natural to ask what other attributes are being tied together here. In combat, it's just enough to know that there is this person facing you, defending this position. So maybe there's something, something there. Now, the other point about eminence is extremely, extremely interesting. Um, a number of people have criticized what goes on in targeted killing operations because if they are justified as a form of self-defense against imminent threat, the technology seems to require us to modify our sense of what counts as an imminent threat. Because, um, because the drones need to be put up in the air and the killing needs to be authorized, it can't be imminent as in seconds away. We have to have a slightly more expansive notion of imminence so that it works with this technology. And I'm not sure whether that's reputable or disreputable. Some of the Israeli arguments in the High Court decision that I mentioned um, tried to think about this in terms of not just eminence but status. That a person who has engaged in a terrorist action on Tuesday and is going to engage in another one on Saturday maintains the status of an unlawful combatant uh, during Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, even though he's back in his, in his uh, brother's garage um, in, in, um, in the West Bank uh, during that time. So sometimes we can use the notion of status to cover some of the work that eminence may not be able to do if it's being used honestly. But I think you're absolutely right. We have had to, and this is a common feature of the discussion, develop a sort of more relaxed notion of eminence if you like, a more relaxed notion of clear and present danger in order to make it possible for these devices to be of any use, any use at all. Thanks so much. Whoops. Thanks so much. Um, my question is um, about the distinction you're making between justifying an action and um, talking about character. And um, I a lot of the things that you were saying at the end sounded to me like they would go towards saying, I kept hearing them as, say, as going towards saying um, that sort of a practice of targeted killing would actually not be justified after all. And the, it sounded like arguments for the, a claim along the lines that maybe individual instances of um, targeted killing we could um, figure out how to justify, but there's gonna be all these concerns about um, justice and implementing those, all these concerns about when we can trust our leadership, ways that they could be abused. That means that something like instituting that as a practice couldn't be justified. And I wondered if that was sort of the nature of the action character distinction or if there was supposed to be something different because that tends to also be my intuition about cases with individuals that the, the reason there's something um, more morally comfortable with somebody who maybe would be justified in um, killing someone out of self-defense but can't bring themselves to do it is because um, that's giving me some information about um, their practice, that they're like the kind of person who like in other situations is also gonna be less likely to kill somebody. And so then that's good. And someone who like too quickly and easily kills in self-defense, even if like they happen to be totally justified that time, that tells me something worrying about like they're that, you know, that they're more likely to kill in less justified circumstances later on. So I wondered if, um, I just kind of was wondering if I was getting a hold of the um, action character distinction that you were making or if it was um, a more, um, if there's sort of a deeper metaphysical dis difference there. Yeah, I don't know how to, how, to, how to pursue that because it's true sometimes if you listen to a virtue theorist, they will h highly resist any attempt to reduce yeah. virtue characterization simply to the likelihood of future actions of a justified or unjustified sort. Sometimes they will say, no, the character assessment is, is relevant in and of itself. Of course, it's going to have a connection to future actions, but it's not just an abbreviation for future probabilities. Now, I've never been much of a virtue theorist in my own work, and this is my first foray into the area. And as, as I said, it's mostly about the virtues of states rather than the virtues of individuals. But think of somebody, and your own example made me think of this. Think of somebody who says, I bought this gun and I hope I have a chance to use it. I will never use it when it's not justified, but I really hope I... So he sits by his door each night and... <laughs> yeah? 
And, and we would say then that that person may be more likely to abuse it, which would be the, the point that you're making. But even if we had some assurance that he wasn't, we'd think of this as a rather unsavory, unsavory thing. So it's that sort of um, dichotomy that I'm, I'm uh, rubbing shoulders with uh, at the moment. Um, I do think that with regard to st states, which are large scale, as I said, astonishingly large arrays of institutions, often governed not only by rules that define their operation, and not only by the, the policy considerations that say when something's justified and when something's not justified, but they are defined by an underlying ethos, sometimes captured in the professionalism of those who are involved, sometimes captured in the uh, patterns of recruitment those are involved, and sometimes captured in patterns of legitimacy that are involved, that I think the character of a state may be, as it were, an independent variable, not utterly distinct from the likelihood of this action or that action but, but um, um, uh, capturing an additional level of evaluation, which, which can't be reduced, can't be reduced to justification of its action. That's, what, that's my hunch, and, yeah. Yeah, great. Good. Uh, thank you, that was really interesting. I wanna go back to Sam's example, um, and I guess what I'd like to ask you is, um, to tease apart a little bit the, um, the feature of imminent threat, which Sam's example got, so now we have people immediately about to do something. Um, and in those cases, I think a lot of us would say, well, it may be unfortunate, but there isn't time to go through the court system and so That's on, right. and so we just go in and take them out, so to speak. That example, I mean, Sam's example seems to me, though, to belong not in box four, but in box one. It's self-defense. Um, but I'd like to tease out a case where, or have you tease out, the work in your talk that's being done or in your account by the, the named list. Yeah. Does it make any difference? I mean, we have an imminent threat um, in the cafe, Sam's cafe. Um, and we have a less immediate imminent threat in some other sort of thing. But it seems to me you're putting a lot of weight in terms of what the nation state becomes when we're doing this targeted of named individuals. And I, I'd like to hear more about what moral difference you think it makes. Either at the individual, I have to take somebody out, and I know what their name is as opposed to just, it's the guy in the fedora who's sitting in the back. Right, right. And, and also then what difference that makes at the level of the, of the state. Because you keep going back to the name, and I'd like to know what work that's doing in your right, account. Right, right. So I began to answer this a little bit in my response to Sam, is it? Yeah, to, to, to Sam's question by talking about what names do, right? So that when you know somebody's name, you have a way of accessing multiple strands of information about them. So there you are, you are in the Civil War, and you're a cavalry officer, and you see a cavalry officer charging towards you, and you recognize that it is so-and-so who was at West Point with you, because officers from both sides were in, at West Point in the 1850s. Um, and you know his name, you know he was the guy who stole your girlfriend, you know something more to connect with this target who is otherwise just an enemy. So names ring alarm bells because they make us wonder what information do people want us to bring together or what information are people bringing together with this name. That was the first point. The second point is to think that the name goes just with the individuation idea and you're telling me, look, saying the guy with his finger on the button, that's an individuating description. Yeah. Well, it's not a name, but it's still it's a highly relevant uh, description. What does the individuation add, add to the picture? And my answer is, um, you're right, both in the self-defense instance and um, we'll take the self-defense instance. You don't know the, need to know the name of the assailant who's attacking you. You just need to know it's that individual there who's attacking me. You use an identifying definite description rather than an identifying name. It indicates that probably we should see whether what's happening can be fitted into this paradigm. And I didn't mention this in the talk, but there really is a third line of justification associated with Kenneth Anderson, who said, this is just raw self-defense. This has got nothing to do with the military paradigm. 
There's nothing to do with the judicial paradigm. This is raw self-defense, the nation and its people against those who would blow them up. Um, and there's, there's something to that. So why can't I explain more convincingly to you why the naming stuff matters so much to me? It is because it's a striking variation from the normal collective and depersonalized aspect of combat. It indicates to us, in my mind, that we are straddling the difference between the judicial paradigm where names are of the essence and the military paradigm where normally they're not. Um, but in the military paradigm, you are right to insist, and so is Sam, that we sometimes use identifying descriptions. To, to So, I, I mean, I'm suitably chastened by your question to think that there's more to be said on this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have very grave misgivings if I heard that the state of California had a death list. Or, you know, Jerry Brown had a list of named individuals who, in his opinion, are the most, un, the most, the greatest perpetrators of injustice in America. Maybe he, the ones that won't ever come to trial or something like. Uh, even if I thought the list was perfectly right, and he had the 14 worst, you know, Americans on the ditto for like the. If I heard that the the mayor of Birmingham or something, or the city government in Birmingham ha had such a list. Um, but, but, that, that, but then what one wanted, my initial response about the misgivings, is that, well, there's, you know, it's not perfect, it's not, but there's a rule of law here. And it's not perfect, but it's, it's genuine. It's a, it's, a, it's a real value. It's a fragile value. And we really owe it a lot, not just in terms of the consequences, maybe, but there are rule of law and fair process values that are very important, and so I might, you know, be very opposed to Jerry Brown, you know, uh, recruiting me for a hit list to go after. I don't know, this maybe sure. maybe, maybe the governor of Kansas is on the list or something. That, that, you know, that, that, that's you know, but where, but with international relations, uh, it seems to me that's I I, I I don't think I can stretch those rule of law intuitions, and it feels to me as though you're trying to stretch them. Um, in international relations, the, it, I mean, it's rough, but it seems the paradigm seems more just like a Lockean state of nature. It doesn't mean anything goes, but it means that there's just the law of nature, or you know, what, uh, the moral law, and you do the best you can to try to uphold that. And the examples about with the character of the United States or the United States, it brings in, you know, confounds of you know your opinions about you, the United States government and U.S. foreign policy over the last few years, and a hundred things where people. There are probably as many opinions among people in this room as there are people in this room, maybe a few more. You know, if there, if there are 100 people in the room, there are probably 140. I have a few opinions. They don't all, they don't all, they're not all consistent. You know, so, but, so, so just take you know, the, the state you think is the most just state. I don't know what, China, Burundi, Norway. New Zealand. Die, you know, yeah. or for, 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 you know, and just then, to, so get the United States out of the picture. In New Zealand, fine. So for me, I mean, I, I think, I mean, this may not be helpful for me or may distract me, but I think, suppose there's a Palestinian group, call it the Jeremy Waldron Brigade or something, it's just formed. And they have a, na they, have, they say, don't talk to me about process or international law or the treaties or was it authorized by you. And whenever we talk in, with international violence about that stuff, it just rings hollow or, you know, it's not that there's nothing, but it's, it's not high on my priority list for what are the things that really matter. So these, these, this, the Jer Jeremy Walden Brigade has come up with a hit list. Uh, maybe, maybe it has Netanyahu, maybe it has, you know, Trump, I don't know, you know, I don't know, John Gray, I don't know, you know. Uh, 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 there, there, I mean, you might convince me it's counterproductive, might be this, might be that, but just on the face of it, I mean, especially if it's, if it's targeting sort of like not just bad guys, but sort of prominent individuals, right? So I might initially be much more friendly toward, I'm, I'm not unalterably opposed to violence against settlers in the West Bank, but I have all sorts of misgivings about that, even for people who I think are just bad people who have clearly done unjust things. But you know, for you know, but, but so, so it's a little guy, big guy kind of thing. But it's not a judicial process or fair. The fair process stuff, I mean, to a first approximation, just drops out in, in, in international relations. Yeah, I don't know that it drops out in international relations. I entirely agree with you that it, that would be the first response that we would make to governor's Bra to Governor Brown's list. Why does this have to be dealt with, other than through the judicial process? We say, look, the FBI ma maintains a list of most wanted individuals, but they are committed as part of their charter to factoring that into, uh, 
to uh, law enforcement uh, model and to judicial process. Now, in the international arena dealing with international terrorism, you're right that the availability of such a process is attenuated. We still pay some attention to it because, at least in theory, as I mentioned, both by Israel and the United States, these operations are sometimes called kill or capture operations. And the capture operation is not just the regular incarceration of prisoners of war, but the uh, capture, detention, trial, and punishment of people who are unlawful combatants by international standards. So we pay some attention. We pay some attention to that, um, to that characteristic, which would otherwise lead us to be very nervous about the list. And sometimes it's a worry about drone strikes for example, as opposed to death squads on the ground, that they leave no alternative of capture. They give no notice that captures uh, in, uh, a possibility. They leave no option of quarter, as we say. So in those cases, it's not, in the international cases, it's not as though due process goes out the window. It's there, it's there in a rudimentary form. But secondly, I would say with regard to the Jerry Brown uh, list of horribles that, that he has, that the concern about due process is not the only concern we have, about, we have about this list. It's that even if due process had become attenuated in California, for all I know it has, there would be still something rum, as I say, about maintaining a list of enemies marked for death in, in, in this way. And I've been trying, um, my God, I've been trying to put my finger, <laughs> to put my finger on, on, on the oddness and unsavoriness of this of this connection, which goes well beyond the possibility of due process, but seems to indicate that we are committing ourselves out of necessity, I think, to a different mode of relation with, with killing. And maybe I'm wrong to think that that difference is something that we need to focus on. Maybe, maybe we should just focus on the circumstances that have elicited it, and then the possibility of whether it's effective, whether it's effective or not. So again, Dick, I'm, I'm sorry, it's an inconclusive answer, but it has those two elements to it. Yep. Perhaps we can just have one final question. Um, what is re really the difference between targeting Castro in the Bay of Pigs? Is the, was he uh, an imminent uh, uh, offense on the United States? I mean, uh, I see, so there is nothing new in what is happening now. Yes. There is a whole big tradition, and now there is a way to justify in a legal or moral sense what is really going on. But if you extend what you are saying, you know, justice in me means that you have committed acts. If you have committed acts, you go according to the law. Self-defense means you can potentially commit action, and who is the one who can commit self-defense acts? Also, probably the, the brownfield son of someone who was a political leader who will also be potentially offended. So why should they pick you against you? So who who is deciding who? We arbitrarily decide who. Right. So there is no morality. So you see that they said that in the media about Yes. This is all a matter of power, isn't it? Yes. I don't know whether it's a matter of power, but I can imagine that it was, first of all, a big issue about what counts as being dangerous when you are talking about future actions, potential actions, whether you're playing a game with probabilities or uh, proceeding purely on the basis of status, which, which I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier. This is a person who has this involvement in this organization and has been involved in these operations in the past. But the point about Castro is an intriguing one because there was a period when in the exercise of our foreign policy in this country, we did engage in plots of assassination um, against high-ranking officials of other governments. Yeah. Against them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, Alain Bay, yes, yes, yes. I'm not sure about that particular case, but th there are plenty of others. We don't, we don't need to go to that. And there came a point where uh, there was a presidential order, a relatively resilient one, that said in no circumstances were we to resort to political assassination in the future. Um, so this whole targeted killing 
program has had to be able to do a lot of fancy footwork to differentiate itself from political assassination, which perhaps can be done when you are killing foot soldiers in Al-Qaeda, but maybe can't be done so easily when you're, when you're killing Anwar al-Awlaki, who's a very high official in, in the, the organization. So it's, it's a problem, and it looks as though in these cases that we're, we're, um, we are um, dealing with the leadership simply as a, 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 at a level dealing with decapitation of organizations, thinking that that might be, might be effective. Used to, I mean, just go back to, General, to Admiral Yamamoto. It used to be the case in the laws of war around the 18th, 19th century that it was regarded as a crime to kill the high leadership of the armies that you're dealing with. When the Confederate forces bombarded general headquarters during the Civil War, it was regarded as barbaric, um, that they would be uh, possibly compromising the safety of very, very high level of generals. And great discussion in this by works of people like Vettel and so on about whether this was unfair to the common soldier who was regarded as legitimate cannon fodder compared to the leadership who, who, who were not. And all of this is relevant to this issue of assassination. Thank you all very much. I apologize to those of you who didn't get to ask your questions. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to the reception afterwards. If you'll please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much.